Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, oh, sir. my goodness. <clears throat> Never mind. Oh, it's going to go off. There we go. Fish on. Fish on. Fish on. Go get it. Go get it. Fish on back there. Got three on. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> what are we doing? Hey, guys. Thanks for clicking on this one. I sure do appreciate it. Uh, this is another episode in my striped bass fishing right here right now series and the reason I put this series together is Because the striped bass move so much they're extremely difficult to catch when you first get started And even when you have some experience it can be hard to be consistent So these videos are going to be in salt and freshwater throughout the entire time of the year This one here is a freshwater one and the reason they're trickier in freshwater is because these striped bass live in salt water They're a migratory fish they move all up and down the coast, spawning on both coasts, really. They could be deep in the ocean or they could be way, way up in the, in the rivers and only foot of water. So all those urges exist in that fish. And when we put that fish into a lake, the urges remain. So it can't do everything that it was doing in saltwater, of course. It's landlocked. But these fish will feel the urge to spawn just like they did in saltwater. And they'll go all the way up these lakes, way up in the river systems to spawn. They'll come back down they'll uh, do things like go deeper in summer because they need, need that cold water you know in, in the salt they would just move north you know up the coast but they can't do that here so they go deep you can catch them 40 feet deep one day and you come back five six weeks later and they're nowhere near there and there are two feet of water backs in the creeks so that's why i wanted to do this to really help you guys get situated uh please any, put any questions you have in the comments i do my best to answer every single one I feel the power of this series is when the video posts so many videos I put up and a lot of other people do too it takes a lot of time to edit them sometimes and by the time I put the video up that tendency or that uh, way to fish may be gone so it's very tough for you guys to watch it and learn from it because uh, you know it just happened isn't gonna work right now you know the year changes during the year they do everything different all 12 months so I wanted to do this so when it pops up in your feed you know if you subscribe it'll pop up when the video pops up and it says you know whatever freshwater fishing uh, right now it means when you click on it that's an effective way to catch fish right now so you can just watch the video take some notes or whatever you know I don't know if you're if you uh, I want to keep the videos on your phone put them in a playlist I'll put them on a playlist here on YouTube so you can always go back and reference them but that's why I wanted to do it so the videos pop up no guesswork watch the tendencies watch the uh, methods Watch the techniques and you could apply that to your nearest water and catch striped bass. These are very unique fish, especially when you take them from salt and put them in fresh water. They will repeat the same patterns year after year over and over and over again. So don't get hung up on which lake these videos were shot on. You know, in the NSBA, the freshwater tournament days, I learned so much. Absolutely incredible stuff that we picked up from fishing all these different lakes and stuff totally surprising. You could take what you learned on your lake, drive 800 miles, and do well with the same exact techniques on their lake. I've seen countless guys in the NSBA win tournaments. I mean, big tournaments, 200 teams tournaments, you know. And, uh, you know, they beat out 50 guides that are on that lake. And they never fished a lake before. They just used what they knew from their lake, applied it there, and had great success. It really is a unique situation with these striped bass, the way they just do the same thing over and over again. I hope you guys uh, enjoyed this one. Hope you guys catch a lot more fish because of it. Please put any questions down in the comments. Of course, I'll try to answer every single one. And please subscribe, like, all that good stuff. Please stay safe on the water and leave a few for me. Love you. Mean it. <laughs> Just about to record that screen. We see we all went through about seven or eight fish. Not really big. And he hooked up on a U rig. But I was at 75. Right, right there, right there. Oh, button up, tripled up. Can we get a quad? Can we get a quad? A little better fish on this one. You might have more than one fish. Yeah, you might. <laughs> I'm watching the chaos. All right, man. So the word of the day is adapt. Maybe you never troll. It's worth trying, man. Do whatever you need to do to catch those fish. So many people I talk to, well, I only troll, I only use live bait, I only use cut bait. Step outside your comfort zone. He came off? All right, put it in the rod holder and catch this one. Stick that in the rod holder first. That was a good fish, too. I need to go.
Amazing. You gotta go over. Chaos! Chaos! Alright, so what I was saying. Don't be afraid to try something new. Don't label yourself. These fish aren't huge, but they're striped bass and we want to catch them. Middle of summer, these fish aren't very deep. Why do you think these fish don't go deep here, Steve? Any ideas? Yeah, the, the water's so still, there's no oxygen for them. They're, they can't live below the thermoclines. Thermoclines probably at about 12 feet. We got a tree on our left side here. Marking a standing tree right there. Now our surface step here is 92, so you don't want to sit and revive the fish at the surface. You want to dive bomb them straight down as best you could. Man, he really wanted that side. Yeah. Right there. So we just drop them head first and that's it. As quick as you can because that top water is 92. If holding them and reviving them there, you're not doing them any favors. Actually 95 right now. He'll cook his brain, get him down to that cooler water. There's a couple fish down below 15 feet. Yeah, way over a tree. There's a tree right there. Don't miss a fish. Fish on. Oh, on or off in the back. Oh, he's on. Fish on. Go get him, Steve. Oh, it's a triple. It's, it's another triple, and it's only a triple because we only had three out. And it's a triple, we only had three out. <laughs> the man's oh, oh, man! Oh, man! I think it was off and another one on. So that's, that's four with three lines out. <laughs> Here, just catch this one. I'll get that one back in order. All right, I want to get them back quick. The water's so hot. Can't believe how feisty they are, man. All the way to the boat, they fight, and then they fight again once you get them in. And perfect release. All right, back in gear, get more. Craziness. Well, like I was just saying, we were talking, we we're catching these fish off this red bank point, of, red bank and a point here, it's 18 to 22 foot of water. Our neck, we have another location up here, about a mile, that's gonna be a similar setup that we're gonna try and see if there may be a group of fish there, because they're gonna, Normally, they're, they may, they're going to be in a similar pattern in a different, you know. Um, sure, makes sense. Yeah, makes perfect sense. Yeah, like, you know, my example was Carl Lake. People get intimidated, but, because the lake's so big. But if they're on, if they're keying on secondary points or the mouth of the creeks, they're pretty much doing that in every creek. It's not like it's a, you got to search the whole lake. Right. Kind of, so, you know, try to mimic whatever's working. And like you were saying earlier, be versatile. Start out with everything different until you figure out what works. Because <laughs> it's not going to be the same sure. every day. And get you some of these things. They're <laughs> awesome. <A little> outdoor <laughs> AC. Have we had a head on that uh that one with the plastic since we put that? I thought we had a bump, we had a bump, we had a bump one time. Yeah. I was wondering if we should try to find something that's had a little more tail Yeah, a little action. wiggle too. Because that thing just kind of... Yeah. I don't know. I mean, it's the only what you got. So, of course, we didn't have enough sense to bring more of these, but... This, with this chartreuse tail, with this more action, has actually been way more productive than this straighter. Yep. Like, this is, but this is tore up pretty good. Yeah, that's, that's experienced. See all these little schools of bait. What do you think that is? is that thread fin or? Yeah, this looks mostly got thread fin. There's some some gizzard. Gizzards used to be the primary bait in here, but they they started stocking thread fins. I don't know if that has any effect to why we're not getting the side fish, or if it's because of the different strain going from the Roanoke fish to the Cape Fear fish. I guess you know 
Anybody's guess is as good as anybody else? All right, for you guys that have never done this before, it's gonna be your first time. What you didn't see was we rode around, we tried a few spots that Steve knows of. He, he lives right around the corner from here, so he fished it quite a bit. I only fished it a handful of times myself, so we hit five or six spots and went over them with the fish finder to see what we can mark. And we marked them on a few spots, not real heavy, to spread out, which isn't a bad thing when they're spread out. Sometimes they're eating better, you know? So if you're gonna come do this on any lake in the summer, you want to look around first, see what you're marking. At least mark bait if you're not marking a lot of fish. If you can mark fish, of course, that's the best thing you want, of course, right? But we're pulling several different baits. We got some uh, umbrella rigs out, 20-inch umbrella rigs with nine baits on them. They're just storm swim baits. Two of them are lead core, which is single swim baits on them. But everything's a different color, you know, so we scatter the depths. But we don't want to go too deep with these. We're looking at where we're marking the fish and above. So we're only marking these fish about... 10, 12, maybe 15 feet down. So all these lines are between 15 and like eight foot out. And uh, you know, the fish are gonna move up to eat anyway. So that's what you wanna do. You don't need downriggers for this. Uh, yes, sir, yes, sir. Oh yes, sir. my goodness. <laughs> Never mind. Oh, it's gonna go off. There we go. Fish on, fish on, fish on. Go get it, go get it. Fish on back there. Got three on. Oh my goodness. <laughs> What are we doing? Oh. What are we doing? Craziness. You're gonna have to, you're gonna have to forget one. The guard will do it. That's four on it. You got four on it? Oh, I'll four on it. One on this one right here, too. Okay, I can pop it out of gear there. Come on up, boy. Get him. Jeez, this one's pretty good, dude. Is it? No, oh, it's, oh, it's a lot of fish. That one came off. What was it? Oh, no, he's on there. Yeah, yeah. I, I thought that was me. <laughs> I mean, I'm must have two on that are swimming the same direction. That's a pretty fish there, buddy. Yeah, Alright, so we were having miles and miles of nothing, man. Nothing. Just dead, dead water. We were just about to move. And we came across just an acre of fish. But we came across the other point that Steve was pointing to. Just like he said. This one come off. Happened just like he said. Yeah, I got two over here. Okay, He's off. Seven pounds, really? Just grab the rig right in the middle and lift it right in. Right here? Yeah. Hello. That's a nice one. I seen one that nice in a little while. Pretty. All right. So again, I don't want to hold this fish at the surface because it's 95 degrees. Just a few feet down, it goes into the 80s. So, so I'm gonna try and release them quick. Right down. Good deal. He has, he has a little one. I think that one might be a keeper too. No. Nah. Pretty. Got stuck. <laughs> all right, got a little bit of a mess, but that's all right, we'll take it. All right, Steve, so the most common question I get about a fish finder is, after you pass over a fish, they wanna know where that fish is. And it's kind of hard to describe. You gotta keep in mind that after you mark a fish, anything that's in the history is just a picture of what you passed over. The scroll speed has nothing to do with where those fish are. Imagine if all the fish are on the screen, you take a screenshot. And now that screenshot just moves over to the left and out of your way. That's what your history is. It has nothing to do with where the fish are. It's just a moment in time. So everything that's in the, the A-scope here is directly under the boat now. Once it's past that A-scope, this is just the history. It's just a picture of what happened. That does not help us at all finding the fish. The quickest way and easiest way to find out exactly where those fish are. Look at this boat coming in between both of us. The easiest way to find those fish is touch the screen. You just touch the screen here on those marks. That fish is 107, that mark is 112, 117. See, it's getting further and further away from us. But now we know where that mark was. It doesn't help a whole lot because we don't, that fish is swimming. You know, we don't know where that fish is, but we're using it to find isolated schools. That was a school of white bass right there. But if you want to set a waypoint on it, you can just touch it, hit your check mark waypoint at cursor 
and now we have a mark on it. Come over to our chart. And there it is, that's that waypoint right there. But for those of you asking, you know, after the fish passes under the boat, where the heck is it? Well, our transducer is looking down. It was under the boat. It was the depth it says when it passes through the A-scope. After we leave it, the fish could swim completely different in a different spot, different speed could be gone. We could scare it away, who knows? But for a good guesstimation, just touch it on the screen. Look down here in the bottom left, 312 foot, and it gives you an idea of how far away from you are. If you wanna put a waypoint on that, just go ahead and do your check, waypoint. And now we go to our chart. You're gonna go ahead and see that waypoint right there. And these machines are tied together. If you have your machines networked, you can set a waypoint on one and it'll set it on all the other ones that are networked. But that's basically my advice if you want to know where those fish are. Here's an osprey. Wow. We need a cut bait fish right here. We need to anchor up. Look at that, Steve. Holy cow. You need to set a waypoint on that. All right, so normally what I would do if I, if I was out here and had enough time to have bait and stuff, those fish are right along those points and it's school sitting right there every time. Sun's starting to go down. I would absolutely beach the boat right there, beach or anchor and cut bait right there because those fish are right on that contour. They're from, they aren't some deeper fish too and they're gonna move up. As the sun goes down, they'll start to move up more and more shallow on most lakes anyway. I have not done that here, but that is like my knee-jerk reaction when I see that. They're not moving, they're sitting there. They're gonna move only shallower. Double anchor or beach the boat. Put out your cut bait, cut herring if you can find it. There's no herring in this lake. No herring here? No herring in this lake. All right, cut, cut chad, or you can bring, I guess, your- uh, Red bands or your- Yeah. Lizards. Hey guys, so me and Mike were talking after we made this video that we really didn't go over the lead core setup that we were using very well. So the way the lead core is, it is the lead core line, which is a braided hollow braid that has a lead center attached to a monofilament leader is what I use. The way I connect this leader is you take the lead out, you run the mono inside of the hollow braid and then just do a regular square knot. That'll hold anything you ever want to hold. The other trick to the lead core is that it changes colors. Let me see if I can get a let you see that really well but it changes colors every 10 yards or 30 feet and depending on the weight lead core and the you know speed weight of your rig something you'll have to kind of play with and learn yourself but that's how you tell how far out it is and that, that's what decides how deep your bait runs in our particular case we were running about three three and a three point three and we were doing about four feet per color in the water.